1914, Italy was arguably one of the most interesting nations, split between two camps, struggling to figure out where it fit into the world, a new nation seeking approval from the other great powers in the colonial game, is a personality it shared with Germany. Yet, the two nations still could not be more different. Germany was an industrial power block in Central Europe, controlling the continent through diplomatic and economic intrigue. Italy, on the other hand, had none of this. In fact, they still had not yet fully finished their goal of unification. Not only was Italy in Germany's shadow in this regard, but Italy lived under another shadow, the old Roman Empire, which they would be forever compared to. An ambition that, in the modern world, they would never be able to match. Further, Italy was in conflict with how it saw itself, and who it wanted to be. Colonies versus cultural unity will be a theme in this video, and was a question that troubled many Italian statesmen at the time. Why Italy joined the Triple Alliance, why Italy abandoned the Triple Alliance, and why Italy sided with the Entente will all be answered in today's video, alongside their war aims. Italy's conflict of interest starts with France. The French had come to Italy's aid in the Unification War against Austria, and yet Italy had their eyes set on Tunisia, a logical start to colony for Italy which would have great historical significance if they were to hold on to it. This was the land of Rome's old rival, Carthage, yet instead the French occupied the region in 1881. This angered many Italians and happened during a time of decreasing trade between the two powers. Naturally, the Germans, who shared their grievances with France, looked like a plausible ally. However, it meant also joining the side of their main old rival, Austria-Hungary. The Austro-Hungarian Empire occupied lands that ethnically identified as Italian, and those lands the Italians wanted back. In addition, Italy had overlapping desires over the Balkans. Both powers, along with Russia, saw the potential that this new power vacuum had created. But still, Italy joined the two emperors in 1882, the year after France took Tunisia, and the dual alliance hence became the Triple Alliance. This meant them putting aside their ambitions for cultural unity to focus on the colonial game, a policy decision that would divide many Italians. The treaty is very similar to the dual alliance, however, with some additional clauses of interest. Germany and Austria-Hungary were to assist Italy if attacked by France. Italy would assist Germany if Germany is attacked by France, but in this outcome, Austria-Hungary would not get involved. And finally, if Austria-Hungary or Germany were to be attacked by Russia, they will have to help out each other, but Italy would remain neutral in such an event. Although in the event that two great powers were to attack into the Triple Alliance, such as France and Russia attacking Germany, or the Ottomans and British attacking Germany, then that overrides all previous clauses, and all three signatory powers must support each other militarily. It further goes on to state that any peace talks must also be achieved through a united effort. All parties must agree to the peace for it to pass, and that any Balkan involvement must be settled and agreed to by all powers first. The treaty saw some adjustments in 1912. These basically promised to maintain the status quo in North Africa, and that Germany will support Italy if any nation tried to take colonial North African territories from Italy and that they will try and bring Britain into the fold as well, on their side in such an event. Basically, another clause just to try and isolate France further. And yet, the issue brought up earlier in the video, colonies versus cultural unity, came up again and again in Italian politics. The Triple Alliance suffered from the same problem that the League of the Free Emperors also suffered from, Nobody likes Austria-Hungary. 
despite Bismarck's best efforts to form a diplomatic solution to bring their allies together, the two would continue to be rivals. Italy would renew their partnership in this treaty three more times, however on the other end they were secretly signing private deals with France, which basically eradicated most of their ties to the Triple Alliance. In 1902, they agreed that France has their sphere of influence over Morocco, and Italy has theirs in Libya, but it does not end there. Italy's agreements with Britain were known as the Mediterranean Agreements of 1887. The deal was a promise to try and maintain the status quo in the Mediterranean and the surrounding coastal regions. The British Empire saw the Mediterranean as being under their control, their sea to dominate. This is all because of its strategic importance. On the one hand, it's the fastest route for merchant ships to sail from Britain to India and back through the Suez Canal. On the other, it helps to lock Russia into the Black Sea. A major player in the Mediterranean that Britain would want to secure as a friend and ally was the Kingdom of Italy. In 1887, this was signed with Italy and would later be joined by Austria-Hungary and Spain. Italy gained Britain's support against France in North Africa. Spain likely joined for similar anti-French colonial motivations, whereas Austria-Hungary was more keen on preventing the growing strength of Russia. Bismarck saw no problem with this deal at all. If Britain is working with a Triple Alliance member to counter both Russia and France, then that inadvertently brings Britain closer to Germany. And for this reason, this agreement was not seen as Italy betraying the Triple Alliance. But given the power of hindsight, knowing Britain would side with the Entente, it becomes an important factor to consider. And yet, although the treaty was very anti-Russian, Italy seemed to have little interest in being hostile to Russia. Not only had Italy agreed with the Triple Alliance that they would not get involved if Russia attacked either Austria-Hungary or Germany, but they also signed a secret agreement with the Russian Empire, the Raconice bargain. The King of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, agreed with the Russian Tsar Nicholas II that neither Russia nor Italy can make a political agreement with any other foreign power over the fate of the Balkans without the other power present at the deal. Meaning if Russia and Austria-Hungary divided a split between Serbia for whatever reason, Italy would also have to be present at the table, and Italy will side with Russia over their access to the Dadalese Straits, and in return Russia will support Italian interests in Libya. This further shows Italy's ambitions in the Balkans, but it shows something else too, Italy and Russia both share a rivalry against Austria-Hungary. Could it be possible that the two were perhaps starting their own anti-Austro-Hungarian coalition behind closed doors? Either way, it is certainly against the Triple Alliance, but it gets deeper. Italy recognised Russia's ownership over the Dadalese Straits, which at the time was under Ottoman occupation, therefore it goes counter to the Mediterranean agreements signed with Britain. This small secret treaty alone adds so many more layers to the complexity and depth to the European theatre leading up to the First World War. This deal is a betrayal of not just the Triple Alliance, but of Britain as well. Italy would later bump heads with the Germans too, as the Italians invaded Ottoman Libya in 1911. The Germans supported the Ottoman Empire, likewise did the Austro-Hungarian Empire at this point. Still, although one could argue Italy was not loyal to the Triple Alliance, you could also point out that the Triple Alliance was not loyal to Italy. It seems Italy felt their decision to join the Triple Alliance was made too hastily, and their true desires only needed time to become clear. Italy wanted all Italians united. The colonial game comes second. In fact, even the Entente powers realised this. Paul Camben, French diplomat, stated in 1912, against Austria, she, Italy, harbours a latent hostility that nothing can disarm. And as regards France, 
we have reasons to think that in the event of a conflict, she would remain neutral, or more likely, would await events before taking part. By 1911, they are clearly against the Triple Alliance, but still they renew their treaty with them in 1912, in a way partly showing how much of a shock World War I actually was to the people in charge of the nations, how out of nowhere it came. Italy is living in an 80s teen movie. You like person A, but you are dating person B to get revenge at person A, but person C likes you, and so on. And this is what makes Italy here so interesting, and it goes back to the point I opened with. Italian foreign policy had no clear easy route. They were stuck at a crossroads, and the Italian people were divided as to which route must be taken. So, rather than openly pick a side and stick with it, we see Italy side with basically everybody, keeping their options open, waiting for events to unfold, and then they will make their move, playing to what they see as being to their advantage. Italy's strategy is incredibly smart. It is to be the overlooked power, the forgotten nation in the war, to step in later when both sides need them, and to gain a better offer, and all the while, Germany and Austria-Hungary, it seems, had no idea of Italy's secret agreements. But it must be made clear, it was also other powers being smart with Italy. France healing old wounds with the nation was an effort to weaken the Triple Alliance, and was clearly successful. Germany also to use Italy as a buffer partner to try and bring Britain into the fold, etc. When war broke out, Italy had enough excuses to avoid getting involved. They argued that Austria-Hungary was acting aggressively, and this war was not of defence, but one of aggression. Further, Italy was not legally obligated to join their allies if Russia got involved, unless another party hopped in. And thirdly, it was Germany who declared war on France and Russia, not the other way around, legally making Italy free to make their own decisions. Fourthly, Austria-Hungary has to agree to foreign policy in the Balkans with their allies before acting upon it. Before sending the ultimatum to Serbia, Austria-Hungary had permission from Germany, but never even spoke with Italy. Therefore, Italy never betrayed them, and actually this image is partially wrong, as it does not show the whole picture of all the tiny clauses. This is a story not of Italy betraying the Triple Alliance, but of the Triple Alliance betraying Italy, and Italy merely responding in a natural way. Fun fact, Austria-Hungary only talked about the ultimatum to Berlin, yet Berlin sent the information to Italy. The Italians then sent the info to their legations in Russia. This info was then leaked to the Russians and Romanians, in the hope that these two powers will stop the Empire's ultimatum by appearing more threatening before the demands were sent. Austria-Hungary had cracked the Italian communication code and found out what Italy did. So here, yes, Italy did betray them, you could say. But no, because Germany and Austria-Hungary both told a retired Austrian diplomat, who then told the Russian ambassador in Vienna, who then told the Tsar. So the information was already leaked anyway. And yet, Italy would not remain neutral. They wanted land and prestige, and the only way to achieve that would be to join the war. Russia was the first to offer an agreement. 4th of August, the same day Britain declared war on Germany, they offered the return of ethnically Italian provinces and a right to a powerful position in the Adriatic. Italy also wanted the Dalmatia region, but the Entente powers would not accept this. The people of Dalmatia wished to unite with the Kingdom of Croatia Slavonia. And so the deal fell apart, and the war dragged on. Later, Italy stated that its claim to Dalmatia was a strategic one. They feared a Russian foothold in the Adriatic after the war, and wanted some ports on the western side of the Adriatic to be able to counter Russia in some potential future war. The French believed that getting Italy to side with them 
would make the Entente appear like the side to join, and may convince Romania, Bulgaria, and the Greeks to side with the Entente as well. Russia began to suffer very heavy losses. Their bargaining position was failing, and they needed more allies. The Treaty of London was agreed upon in 1915, which agreed that the Italian regions in Austria-Hungary would go to Italy, a reduced Dalmatia region would be handed over, and the Italians would also gain a chunk out of the Ottoman Empire and an enlargement of their African colonies. And of course, as always, a loan was involved. A £50 million loan to Italy to help fund the war and further industrialisation. Italy declared war on the Central Powers in May 1915. Lastly, the treat was meant to be kept secret, however the treat was not kept secret, it got out and angered the Slavic minor states in the Balkans, who felt Italy would be taking the lands they claimed. Another leak from Italy, which is weird given their most famous icons are plumbers. I usually at this point to understand the war aims, discuss what would happen if the nation in question had achieved pure domination on the battlefield and conquered basically everything, holding the largest position during the peace conference. However, as Italy's involvement into the war was based on the pre-negotiated plan I just went over, any speculation seems pointless, as we already know through the Treaty of London. Maybe if they did a little bit more, they would have gained more on the colonial side of things and maybe would actually have received all the lands that were promised to them. But ultimately, I don't think they would have gained much more than they were legally bound to. If they sided with the Central Powers and won, then I think Italy would have some ethnically Italian-French provinces returned to them, but those were far fewer than the ones in Austria-Hungary. Their main gains in this scenario would be colonial. But in the end, Italy did not seem interested. They wanted to side with the Entente. Overall, it is very clear by this decision that uniting the Italian people was way more important to Italy at the time than building a colonial empire, even if it did take them around 30 years to decide upon that policy. Colonies versus cultural unification. And at last, in 1915, the decision had been fully made. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed and learned something. If you did, please like and subscribe for more. Share with anybody you think may be interested. But for now, until the next one, this has been the history of diplomacy.